the Germanic languages. Native to Northern and Western Europe, they're a pretty cool family of Indo-European languages. You're even listening to me speak one right now. There are well over a billion speakers of Germanic languages, the vast majority of whom speak English. But the other languages are cool as well, so let's talk about them all. There are three branches of Germanic. West Germanic, which includes German, English, Dutch, among others. North Germanic, which includes Swedish, Danish, Norwegian, Icelandic, and East Germanic, which included the Gothic language, but every language in the branch is unfortunately extinct. The common ancestor of all Germanic languages was the reconstructed Proto-Germanic, which existed around 500 BC. Proto-Germanic evolved into other proto-languages that were the common ancestors of their corresponding branches of Germanic. The West Germanic languages all descended from Proto-West Germanic, which is unattested, unlike the ancestor of all North Germanic languages, which we know to be Old Norse. Introductions aside, let's go over the traits and features that modern Germanic languages tend to share. One thing that sticks out is that the Germanic languages have very large vowel inventories, sometimes among the most vowel qualities in the world. The vowels usually come in short and long pairs, often differing in quality. A typical vowel inventory for a Germanic language would be something like a, a, e, 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 i, o, o, e, u, e, 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 u, and schwa, a, in unstressed syllables. Germanic languages have pairs of voice and voiceless plosives, and usually fricatives too. And in many of them, the voiceless plosives are aspirated, except for one next to a fricative. Compare English cool and pan with school and span. Sometimes this is described as a fortis lenis distinction, which means strong and soft, instead of the typical voiceless voice distinction. Germanic languages often have relatively complicated syllable structures, allowing long consonant clusters both at the beginning and ends of syllables. Also notable is the velar nasal ng, which can appear in syllable final position in most of them. The orthographies of Germanic languages can vary, but they tend to treat short and long vowels differently in writing, representing them with the same vowel letter but adding consonants and sometimes other vowel letters to distinguish short from long. Also, most Germanic languages use J for Y like in the IPA. English is just the weird one. Grammar-wise, they have singular plural distinctions like most other Indo-European languages, and usually have some form of grammatical gender distinction. There is also a definite dis distinction between definite nouns, equivalent to the in English, and indefinite nouns, equivalent to a or an. There's usually some form of grammatical case, but in many Germanic languages, this has become limited. Adjectives have comparative and superlative suffixes, equivalent to English suffixes er and est, like in higher and highest. Although these suffixes are generally only used with monosyllabic words and a few disyllabic words, and words with three or more syllables and the remaining disyllabic ones use analytic inflection for this, equivalent to English more and most. In Germanic languages, prepositions, adjectives, and determiners all go before nouns, and the word order is generally SVO. But most of these languages have V2, or verb second word order. Essentially, the verb phrase is always in the second position of a sentence or clause, so if there is an adverbial phrase at the beginning, the verb stays where it is, and the subject moves after the verb. There's also VF, or verb final word order where the main verb of the sentence goes towards the end when an auxiliary verb is present. The verb is also usually moved to the start of the sentence for questions in Germanic languages. Verbs inflect for the past and present tenses, and have analytic word formations for other things like the future tense and perfect aspect. There are strong and weak verbs. Strong verbs undergo something called ablaut, where a vowel in the verb changes for the past tense. Compare English sing and sang, or Dutch slap and sleep. Ablau also occurs for many nouns to form plurals, like with English men and man. Weak verbs, on the other hand, have a suffix added for the past tense, usually with da or ta, assimilating for voicing. Compare German spiele with spielte, and English play with played. Some Germanic languages, namely Dutch and especially German, are notorious for their extensive word compounding, which leads to very long and intimidating words. I should also mention that the Germanic languages tend to have a lot of dialectical variation, and there are many things I say about these languages that don't apply to every dialect of the languages I talk about, so keep that in mind. Now let's talk about the Germanic languages individually, starting with English, which hardly needs any introduction. It's spoken natively mainly in the British Isles, Northern America, Australia, and New Zealand, and is learned throughout the world as an auxiliary language. 
It has the dental fricatives th and the, which were phonetically present in Proto-Germanic, but lost in most others. Proto-Germanic also had wa, and English is one of few to keep it as such, and distinct from va. It also has a velarized l, otherwise known as the dark l. There's a marginal glottal stop phoneme that appears in words like uh oh, and one starting with vowels when emphasizing the word as separate from another. Some British dialects also pronounce intervocalic t as a, uh, as in wa a uh, m British. Some dialects, like received pronunciation in Australian English, are non rhotic, meaning that the r phoneme isn't pronounced in coda position after vowels, sometimes becoming schwa, and other times making vowels pronounced longer. Other dialects, like General American, have rhoticized vowels in place of these. Besides this, though, English has a lack of sounds like a uh, and u. Uh, it has diphthongs a and o instead of a or o, and it has the monothong a. Vowels in general are considerably different than they are in Germanic cognates because of the great vowel shift, which moved the vowels of Middle English around dramatically. English has a lack of phonemic long vowels, although vowels are pronounced long before syllable final voiced obstruence. Compare batch with bad. English is also notorious for its spelling, which has remained fossilized and reflects many historical pronunciations, is riddled with exceptions, especially for loanwords, and overall feels very inconsistent. It uses J for J and Y for Y, again, atypical for a Germanic language, as are SH for SH and CH for CH. C is used for both K and S like in Romance languages, and G can also represent J in some contexts. English also lacks diacritics for special symbols. While a few words of foreign origin do have them, they're often left out as many English keyboards don't support them. One subtle thing about English grammar is that there is zero grammatical gender, being one of a handful of Indo-European languages without it. English lacks personal agreement for verbs. The only form of this is the s suffix for the third person singular in the present tense, not to be confused with the s suffix for nouns, which is the main way of forming plurals, or the apostrophe s in clitic, which marks possession. You could analyze this enclitic as a genitive suffix, but besides that, English lacks any case. But like most Germanic languages without case, still has pronouns with different forms as a subject, object, or a possessive pronoun. Speaking of which, English has independent possessive determiners, pronouns like mine, your, and our, not found in other Germanic languages. English used to have the second person pronouns thou and you, with thou being singular and informal, and you being plural and used as a polite pronoun for the singular. But you ended up replacing thou in all contexts, and left English without a fully grammatical second person plural. English has no suffix for the infinitive form of verbs, instead analytically using two. But in addition to past and present forms, it also has gerund and past participle form of verbs. There's a lack of v2 word order, and word order is mostly only shifted around to sound poetic or one forming questions. Speaking of, English forms questions with the verb do, and this is extremely rare cross-linguistically. While French and Latin have had influence on the lexicon of pretty much all Germanic languages, nowhere is this influence felt more than in English, to the point where words of French and Latin origin individually outnumber those of Germanic origin. Although the native Germanic words are used more in daily conversation, with the French and especially Latin vocabulary typically being more formal, technical, and literary. Of course, being an imperial language, English has many creole languages derived from it. Most of their vocabulary is English-based, but with phonologies and grammars more simple and similar to local languages. Notable creoles include Tokpisin, Jamaican Patwa, Nigerian Pidgin, among many others. I won't be discussing them in detail here, but they're all interesting in their own right. As for languages closely related to English, there's Yola, an extinct language formerly spoken in County Wexford of Ireland, with a revitalization movement, and Scots, spoken in, you guessed it, Scotland. Scots descended from Old English. Scots is distinct from Scottish Gaelic, which is a Celtic language, and Scottish English, which is the formal English standard of Scotland. Scots is also partially mutually intelligible with English, and trying to decipher Scots as an English speaker can be a fun test. While some debate that Scots is just a dialect of English, Scots has plenty of its own distinct history and literature, though it is pretty similar to English. People who speak Scots often speak it on a spectrum between Scots and Scottish English, with the latter prevailing in more formal situations and Scots for informal scenarios. The consonants and vowels are generally similar to those in English, 
though it maintains a velar fricative ch, which is very rare in English, occurring in few varieties. Scots, like many other minority languages we'll see, has no standardized orthography, though spelling is generally based on English with a bit of a Scottish flair. The grammar is also similar but has more noticeable differences. The definite article the has the same form in Scots, but it uses it in places where English doesn't, such as names for languages, days, and seasons. Plurals are a tad bit different. They can still take the suffix sa, but it also has the form us, different plurals end with n, and not all irregular plurals are the same between the two. Scots keeps yon and yonder, distal pronouns from Old English, maintaining a three-way demonstrative pronoun distinction. Plenty of irregular verbs are different from their English counterparts, though the past and present partible suffixes are similar. Plenty of Scots vocabulary is different as well. There's more words of Germanic origin and fewer Romance loanwords. Next up is Dutch. It's spoken primarily in the Netherlands, the Flanders region of Belgium, and Suriname. One of the first things you'll notice hearing Dutch is its unique G sound, which varies from the voice velar fricative R to the voiceless uvular fricative H, depending on the dialect, though G has also reappeared in some loanwords. In Dutch, W shifted to labial dental approximate W, which is contrasted with V. The H sound is voiced H, and voice obstruents at the ends of words are devoiced. Word finally, the sequence un, which appears frequently in the language, is often pronounced a, uh, especially by younger speakers. There's also a lack of a uh sound to correspond to historical long u or e uh with e. Uh. Dutch has a decent number of diphthongs, notably including a, o, uh, and u, uh, and there is a merger of old al with al. One thing that sticks out about Dutch orthography is the digraph ij, which represents the diphthong a and in some contexts, a. Uh. J is normally ya, yeah, but the digraphs tj, dj, sj represents ch, j, and sh respectively. Dutch treats historic short and long vowel pairs differently. Short vowels a, e, i, a, u correspond to long vowels a, e, i, o, u. In orthographic closed syllables, short vowels are the default, written with monographs a, i, o, u, and the long vowels are written with those letters but doubled, except for long e which is spelled with IE. In orthographic open syllables, long vowels are the default, and consonants following the short vowels are doubled. E often represents schwa in unstressed syllables, similar to in German and others. Dutch also lacks diacritics outside of a few loanwords, but sometimes uses an acute accent to show stressed words which have different meaning when unstressed, and diaresis to show that two vowels are pronounced separately and not as a digraph. Dutch is unusual in having plain U represents U, and U is instead written as OE. E is also written EU. In Dutch, CH always represents CH, and is notable for the trigraph SCH, representing CH. As for grammar, Dutch used to have a masculine, feminine, neuter, gender distinction until recently, but masculine and feminine nouns have merged into the common gender, leaving a common neuter distinction. This distinction only matters for definite articles, which are either da or ut, demonstrative pronouns, and for adjective inflection, with all forms having the suffix a, except for those in the singular indefinite neuter. Case forms were also recently lost in Dutch, only surviving in some fixed phrases and partially in pronouns like in English. Dutch also makes extensive use of diminutives, which most often end in ch, and if not, at least end with je. The plural is marked with un for the majority of nouns, and s for most others. Dutch verbs agree for person, changing whether the subject is the first person singular, second person, third person, or if the subject is plural. It also uses the prefix r to form past participles, typically followed by suffixes t for weak verbs and un for strong verbs. Being the language of a colonial empire, Dutch had a few creoles derived from it, but two of them are critically endangered and possibly extinct, and the rest of them are confirmed extinct. There is Renan Tongo, a creole of Suriname that had an abundance of Dutch influence, but is classified as an English creole, not a Dutch creole. Fortunately, there is one language derived from Dutch still alive, and that would be Afrikaans. Spoken primarily in the western part of South Africa, Afrikaans was somewhat creolized from Dutch. There are debates as to whether it's a creole or a daughter language of Dutch, but it's likely both of these to some extent. Vowels and diphthongs have shifted around significantly from their corresponding sounds in Dutch. The G sound is a uvular fricative H, and the velar fricative also merged with its sound. 
though the SCH cluster is pronounced ska in Afrikaans. Dutch sounds z and v correspond to voiceless s and f, though the Dutch w sound shifted to v in Afrikaans, with w as an allophone. Word final consonant clusters were simplified in Afrikaans, especially clusters ending with t. Like most modern Germanic languages, it's written primarily with the Latin alphabet, but Afrikaans is the only Germanic language known to have been written with the Arabic script, though this is rare and historical. While the vowels are pronounced way different, words in Afrikaans are largely spelled the same as they are in Dutch, except for some consonants changing to reflect their Afrikaans pronunciation, and Y to represent the diphthong I. Afrikaans doesn't have any form of grammatical gender, though adjectives still inflect one coming before a noun, but with one form as opposed to two in Dutch. Afrikaans also has the indefinite article as D instead of Dutch, da, or uts. Verbs lack any personal agreement whatsoever, and the past tense was lost, only surviving in a handful of verbs, and for all others, the perfect form of verbs took its place. Afrikaans verbs are very regular for a Germanic language, but a few have irregular perfect forms that alternate with regular conjugations. Sometimes both are used, but with different senses. Afrikaans exhibits the double negative, where two negative words complement each other instead of canceling each other out. Also related to Dutch is Limburgish, spoken primarily in the Limburg provinces of the Netherlands and Belgium. Limburgish is one of many Germanic languages that are at various levels of endangerment, as various local languages and dialects are being abandoned in favor of national standard languages. Fortunately, Limburgish is in little danger of going outright extinct with the amount of speakers it has, but it's still a language with a smaller speaking community and fewer resources. There is no standardized version of Limburgish, so descriptions of the language vary by the dialect. What the varieties of Limburgish do have in common is that they tend to have a lot of vowels, especially monophthongs. Various dialects have a group of palatal sounds, which are rare in Germanic languages, but not as rare as tone, which appears in some varieties of Limburgish. There's a so-called push tone, with falling pitch and a dragging tone, with a fall followed by a rise. And these tones can make both grammatical and lexical distinctions between words. Limburgish has no official spelling for all of its dialects, but there is the Limburgish Language Council Standard, which is characterized by many acute accents, bravs, umlauts, circumflexes, and double vowels. Like other Germanic languages, Limburgish uses ablaut for strong verbs in some plurals, but it also uses ablaut to form certain diminutives. Limburgish also has three grammatical genders instead of two, has a gerund form for verbs, distinguishes the indicative and subjunctive moods, and it can use the reflexive pronoun sich to express a benefactive object. Next up is the Frisian language, or more accurately, the Frisian languages. There's Western Frisian, spoken in the Friesland province of the Netherlands, Northern Frisian, and Sauterland Frisian, both spoken in parts of Germany. Sauterland and North Frisian are both highly endangered, and West Frisian with its higher number of speakers is the one I'll be describing today. All the Frisian languages are a part of the Anglo-Frisian subbranch of West Germanic, which also includes English, making them closely related. Frisian has a distinction between v and w, and has a voiceless post-velar fricative trill, which is between velar and uvular, and pronounced both as a fricative and voiceless. It also has word-final obstruent devoicing and phonetic affricates z and z, which are rare in Germanic languages. West Frisian has a bit more vowel distinctions than a typical Germanic language, and short long vowel pairs are less often distinguished by quality alone. Frisian also has a handful of diphthongs, some of which come in rising and falling pairs. Frisian orthography is notable for having acute accents and circumflexes to distinguish some of its many vowels. West Frisian nouns are either grammatically common or neuter, as in Dutch, and the formation of plurals and diminutives are generally similar. Frisian lost its accusative and dative cases, but still has a genitive suffix us. Regular weak verbs have two types, of verbs and ya verbs, which determine the personal slash tense suffixes that they take. There are also two types of infinitives for verbs, a and uninfinitives, which used to be verbal and nominal respectively, but are now mostly used interchangeably. Next, I'm going to talk about German. German exhibits diglossia where there are two forms of the language that native speakers tend to know. Standard German, what people usually mean when they say German, is the formal and literary language, being official in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. 
but there are also many local varieties of German that vary widely from each other and from the standard variety, that are generally more often spoken in informal situations with friends and family. German varieties are generally divided between High and Low German, Hochdeutsch and Plattdeutsch, with Low German spoken in Northern Germany and High German spoken elsewhere, which can be further split into Central German and Upper German. I'll talk more about the dialects later, but for now, Standard German. It underwent the High German consonant shift, also affecting the aforementioned High German varieties. Voiceless stops Patsaka became fricatives Fasaka in some contexts, and in others, they Africatized to Fatsaka, though the last sound doesn't occur in Standard German. Voice stops Badaga then became Patsaka, and old voice fricatives Vadaga shifted to their corresponding plosives. Tsa isn't found in many other Germanic languages, and P is an extremely rare sound cross-linguistically. Once again, obstruents in German devoice at the ends of words, and the only vowel usually allowed at the ends of multisyllabic words is the schwa. German has both the voiceless palatal fricative hia and wieler ch, which are allophones of each other. The sequences on an ul at the end of words are often syllabic consonants n and l. Standard German monophthongs are pretty typical for a Germanic language, and it has three main diphthongs, i, au, and oi. In onset position, the German rhotic is typically a uvular sound, but at the ends of syllables, the rhotic tends to reduce to a, forming diphthongs with pretty much every other vowel. One thing that immediately sticks out about German spelling is that every noun has its first letter capitalized as if it were the start of a sentence. This often makes distinctions in spelling between nouns and non-nouns that sound the same. German has umlaut diacritics to represent e, er, u, and their short equivalents, as well as the letter s z, completely unique to German. It's used to indicate a voiceless s following a long vowel, whereas using a normal letter s would represent voice z, a double s would make the vowel short, and z usually represents z, not z. The letter derived from a combination of s and z, reflected in its name, s z. German uses just a u for au, but both eu and a umlaut u for oi, and ai, ei, ay, and ey for i. Vowel letters are typically pronounced long after only one consonant, and can be indicated to be long by putting an h after them, or using the digraphs aa, ee, ie, or oo, when followed by more than one consonant. When short vowels are phonetically followed by one consonant, the consonant letter is typically doubled, though before short vowels, k and t are written ck and tz respectively. German uses the letter W for V, as W doesn't appear in the language, and both F and V for F. The trigraph SCH is used for SH, and quadgraphs TSCH and DSCH represent CH and J respectively. As for grammar, plurals in German are highly unpredictable, following one of a handful of different patterns. German retains the masculine, feminine, and neuter genders, and also keeps four cases from Proto-Germanic, nominative, accusative, genitive, and dative. Adjectives, articles, possessive pronouns, and demonstrative pronouns all agree for case, gender, and number, though plural nouns neutralize the gender distinction. Adjectives in German have so-called strong and weak inflections. The weak inflection is used if the adjective follows a definite article, and the strong inflection is used if the adjective is by itself. There's also mixed inflection, used with indefinite articles and possessive pronouns which has some endings the same as the weak inflections, and others the same as strong inflections. German verbs agree for the pronoun of the subject, with a full six-way distinction for the three persons and two numbers. On top of the indicative, imperative, and conditional moods, German retains the subjunctive mood, though it's not used much anymore, and there are a plethora of verbal prefixes which can add extra meaning to a verb root. Standard German infinitives end in n, presence participles are formed with ga, and the gerund is formed by adding d to the infinitive. Now to talk about some non-standard German varieties, starting with Bavarian. It's a group of High German dialects spoken in the German state of Bavaria, as well as Austria, although in both countries, Standard German is used for formal situations. Phonology-wise, Bavarian tends to use an alveolar trill instead of a uvular rhotic, and the sus sound isn't voiced where it would be in the Standard language. Many vowels are shifted around compared to Standard German, like a corresponding to Bavarian o, Standard German i to o, and even sequences like al corresponding to oi. Bavarian underwent the High German consonant shift, and made the change of k shifting to voiceless velar affricates k. Bavarian is also notable for its diphthongs ending with a, 
those being ea, oa, ia, and ua. Bavarian lacks the genitive case for nouns, and also lacks the past tense of verbs, instead expressing past events with the perfective form. It also has the optative mood, expressing things that the speaker believes should happen, and the prefix g in Standard German reduces to just g in Bavarian. There's also a whole ton of vocabulary that is unique to Bavarian and not used in the Standard language. Besides the High German dialects, there's also the many varieties of Low German, or Plattdeutsch as they're called. The specific variety I'll be covering is Northern Low Saxon, spoken in northwestern Germany in an area including the cities of Bremen and Hamburg. The Low German varieties, of course, didn't undergo the High German consonant shift, so many words have different consonants compared to their Standard German counterparts. And there's also no pf, tz, or k. As for Northern Low Saxon, it has the diphthongs a, o, i, au, oi, and o, distinguishes s with z, and velar ch with glottal h. Some other Low German dialects also underwent raising, where some sounds shifted to ie or o in certain contexts. Northern Low Saxon has the masculine, feminine, and neuter genders, though the gender assignment of nouns can vary between Low German dialects, and plurals are also highly irregular. The indefinite article is pronounced as a syllabic nasal, n. The language lost the genitive case, using the preposition van, meaning from, instead to form possessive phrases, and the accusative and dative cases also merged with each other, leaving a 2K system. Now time for a quick shout out to all the other Low German variety groups, which are... <gasps> Westphalian, Eastphalian, Mecklenburg Pomeranian, Brandenburgish, Middle Pomeranian, Eastern Pomeranian, and Low Prussian. And while we're at it, I'm mentioning the Central German dialects too, Moselle Franconian, Rhine Franconian, Central Hessian, Northern Hessian, Eastern Hessian, Thuringian, Upper Saxon, Northern Upper Saxon, South Merkish, Silesian German, High Prussian, Hunsrik, which is spoken in Brazil, and the remaining Upper German varieties, Upper Franconian, East Franconian, South Franconian, Swabian, Cimbrian and Mokinol, spoken in Northern Italy, Low Alemannic, Middle Alemannic, High Alemannic, and Highest Alemannic, with the High and Highest Alemannic languages comprising what is known as Swiss German. <sighs> <sighs> to calm myself down, I'm going to talk about Luxembourgish. It's spoken in Luxembourg, and is a form of Moselle Franconian, one of those central German dialects, but is standardized in Luxembourg, and considered its own language distinct from German as a result. Natively, it has the monophthong a, and short and long vowel pairs tend not to differ in quality. Some vowels are exclusive to loanwords, those being u, u, e, and e, with some nasal vowels from French also. It has plenty of diphthongs, i, o, i, au, i, au, ia, u, non-native oi, and plenty of rhotic diphthongs, like in German. Luxembourgish has the uvular fricatives h and r, which can allophonically palatalize to s and z. There's also the native affricates tz, ch, and rare z, alongside pf, which appears in loans from German. Luxembourgish follows the Eiffler rule, where coda n is dropped before most consonants with the exception of ta, da, na, za, and ha. This also applies to many German dialects of the Eiffel region. Luxembourgish uses orthographic double vowels to mark long vowels, and uses ii for long e instead of ie, like in other Germanic languages. ie instead represents ia, and similarly ue represents ua. It also uses a umlaut for a, and e umlaut for a in some contexts. Acute e is used for a sometimes, but the digraph acute e i represents i, and o u is o. Luxembourgish has the three grammatical genders from Proto Germanic and has three grammatical cases, losing the genitive. Like in varieties of German, the definite article inflects, with one form being d, which forms new onset consonant clusters and can allophonically be t. It should be noted that while attributive adjectives inflect in Luxembourgish, adjectives don't inflect when they act as the predicate. The same can probably be said for most of the other Germanic languages. Luxembourgish has a whole ton of loanwords from French, since it's spoken near the French-speaking Walloon region of Belgium, to the point where even some basic words and phrases are French loans. There's also a sizable amount of loanwords from Standard German, among other languages. Next up is Yiddish. The language was spoken by the Ashkenazi Jews, who lived across much of Europe. There were Eastern and Western dialects, but the Western dialects died out in the 1800s due to language assimilation. And then in the mid-1900s, an unspeakably awful atrocity happened, 
leading to 5 million of the 11 to 13 million Yiddish speakers to be killed. After the Second World War, the Jewish community started to adopt modern Hebrew as their primary language, causing Yiddish to decline further, with modern estimates ranging from a million speakers to only a couple of hundred thousand. There are two types of modern Yiddish. One is Yivo, a standardized form of the language, more often found in modern descriptions of Yiddish, and Chassidish Yiddish, which native Yiddish speakers speak some form of. Chassidish is more of a catch-all term, and can be further subdivided by country, like Litvish, Polish, Dutch, Ukrainian, and Hungarian. Across all dialects, vocabulary words and to a lesser extent grammar are mostly the same, but pronunciation can vary a whole lot. Yiddish is generally based on High German with influence from Biblical Hebrew, and many loanwords from Slavic languages due to close proximity. Vowels are quite variable by the dialect, but in standard Yiddish at least, the length distinction for vowels was lost, and the vowels e e merged to e e, and e u to e i. Being a language of the Jewish community, Yiddish is written with the Hebrew alphabet. Sometimes spellings are even the same as in modern Hebrew. Traditionally in Biblical Hebrew, it acted more as an objad, but Yiddish writes most of its vowels out like a typical alphabet. Although there aren't enough letters for all the consonants and vowels, so optional diacritics are used to distinguish between them. Grammar-wise, Yiddish has the nominative, accusative, and dative cases, but no genitive case. And the inflection of adjectives, articles, and verbs works similarly to how it does in Standard German. Yiddish also had influence on the development of modern Hebrew, bringing plenty of vocabulary words and even the uvular ch and r sounds into the language. We're finally done with the West Germanic languages. Now for the North Germanic languages. Generally, they can be split up two ways. One is by ancestry, with East Scandinavian, including Swedish and Danish, and West Scandinavian, which includes Norwegian, Icelandic, and Faroese. Though with Norwegian in particular, due to close contact and influence with East Scandinavian and the rest of Europe, is more in line with Swedish and Danish, forming the so-called continental Scandinavian languages to include all three of them, leaving Icelandic and Faroese as insular Scandinavian languages. We'll talk about the continental Scandinavian languages first, starting with Swedish. It's spoken in Sweden and in some parts of Finland, with the highest number of speakers out of the northern Germanic languages. Swedish has the s sound and the sj sound, an extremely rare sound almost unique to Swedish. It's described as a simultaneous sh and h sound, but in many dialects it's pronounced as a plain sh, and in other regions it's pronounced h, with a few other allophones as well. In general, Swedish dialects can vary a lot with pronunciation, such as with the rhotic's many variations. The rhotic also forms retroflex consonants, one coming before alveolar ones. RT is realized as d, RS is realized as sh, and so on. Swedish, like the other northern Germanic languages, lacks a z phoneme, and coda g is often dropped from the ends of words. Swedish vowels, of course, come in short and long pairs, but for short vowels, the following consonant is also geminated, pronounced longer. So double consonants not only signify that the preceding vowel is short, but that the consonant is pronounced with gemination. Swedish has the short vowel ö uh, and corresponding long vowel ü, uh, which don't occur in most other Germanic languages. And unlike said Germanic languages, Swedish tends not to reduce its vowels as much, with many words still ending in a, and overall lacking a phonemic unstressed schwa. Swedish also has pitch accent, where a certain pitch pattern is applied to the span of a word which affects the tone of the word's syllables. Swedish has two pitch accent patterns, well, with rising pitch on the stressed syllable before falling on the following unstressed syllable, and another pitch pattern which involves falling, then rising, then falling again between the two syllables. Rutten. Rutten. Swedish uses the letter Y to represent U and Ö, and U represents the vowel Ö and Ö, with U and Ö being written as O instead, which can also represent O or A, but those two latter sounds can also be written as A with an overring also using a umlaut for e and e, and o umlaut for e and e. Due to some historical spelling, Swedish has multiple consonant monographs, digraphs, and trigraphs that can represent y, s, or sh. Moving on to grammar, there's a gender distinction between common and neuter, and definiteness is suffixed to nouns, with un for common nouns and ut for deuter nouns. Interestingly, these correlate to Swedish's two indefinite articles, n and et. There are plural endings ar, er, and ur, mostly with common nouns, 
with n for neuter nouns ending in vowels. Plenty of nouns also have unmarked plurals. Swedish has a possessive suffix s, commonly classified as a clitic instead of a genitive case. With strong inflection, Swedish adjectives agree for if a noun is common gender, neuter gender, or is plural, but attributive adjectives have only one form of the weak inflection. Swedish has a supine form of verbs, a type of verbal noun, which is also used for some compound verb forms. There is absolutely no personal agreement for verbs, so verbs stay the same regardless of the subject. Infinitives most often end in a, the present tense most often ends with er, and the past tense uses either ablaut or the suffix de or te. The passive can be formed by adding s to the infinitive, like in other Scandinavian languages, and there are a few other ways to form passives too, each with their own nuances. Next up is Danish. The most prevalent thing about the sound of Danish is a phenomenon known as stud. In syllables with stud, the first part is articulated with high pitch, and the second part is pronounced with a lower pitch and has an added creaky voice. Hena. Hun. This tends to occur with syllables that used to have a plosive that was later dropped. Danish also has the soft D, which is a nice way of saying the velarized laminal alveolar approximant, Ooh. typically occurring syllable finally. Danish also has the most oral vowels out of any Germanic language, and has one of the largest vowel inventories in the world. Danish has a phonemic schwa in unstressed syllables, but often assimilates with the vowel coming before it, and tends to be dropped before consonants, turning those into syllabic consonants. Syllable initially, Danish's rhotic is a voice uvular of fricative r, and reduces to a in coda position. Danish's leanest consonants are unvoiced bataka, and contrast with aspirated fortis consonants pa, ta, and ka. Liquids ya, la, r, are also devoiced to sh, h, and h, after pa, ta, ka. Danish has the sounds of a and xia, and while it doesn't have pitch accent, there is contrastive stress. Danish orthography has A with an overring like in Swedish, but instead of umlauts, it has a ligature of A and E, and O with a stroke. After vowels, orthographic G and V typically represent glides, Y and U respectively. Danish grammar is pretty similar to Swedish, but is actually a bit simpler due to vowel reduction. So Swedish plurals R, R, Or all correspond to simply Ö uh, in Danish, and present tense R and Ö uh, both reduce to Ö. Uh. They are common in neuter genders, definite suffixing, the possessive suffix s, and adjectives inflect similarly to Swedish. The infinitive is form partially isolating, with a preceding the verb, and the verb taking a at the end. Norwegian is next. While like with Swedish there are many locally spoken dialects across Norway, there isn't one official standard variety, but two, Bukmål in Ny Norsk. Bukmål has more influence from Danish, from when Denmark ruled over Norway, while Nu Norsk is based more on traditional dialects from West Norway, with less Danish influence. Both forms are primarily used for writing, and the regions of Norway choose which standard language they use officially, although Norwegians learn both standards in school. Pronunciation varies heavily from region to region, but in general, there are both short and long consonants, phonetic retroflex consonants like in Swedish, and liquids v, l, r are voiceless or only partially voiced f, l, h, r after pa, ta, ka, fa. There's a hya phoneme corresponding to Swedish sia, with the sound even being one of its allophones, and also has the vowels u and u. Norwegian's diphthongs stand out. There is o, i, o, u, a, o, and i. And Nynorsk tends to preserve diphthongs that are otherwise monophthongs in bukmål. Norwegian also has pitch accent, and works similarly to Swedish. Norwegian uses the same alphabet as Danish does, the Dano-Norwegian alphabet, with many of the same spellings for words, especially in Bukmål. Though in Nynorsk, words often have different spellings and pronunciations from Danish. Norwegian also has various diacritics that are used for distinguishing homonyms, especially in Nynorsk. The grammar is similar to Swedish and Danish, with definite suffixing, plural formation, and a lack of personal verb conjugation. There's a three-gender system in Nynorsk with masculine, feminine, and neuter, while Bukmol can use that or the common neuter distinction. Adjectives tend to inflect for gender and number, and adverbs can be formed from adjectives, most often with suffix t. And now for the moment the sweaty language nerds have all been waiting for, Icelandic. Spoken in Iceland, Icelandic is a very traditional North Germanic language, only having fully diverged from Old Norse about 300 years ago 
and has many features different from the other Germanic languages, some inherited from Norse, and others are unique developments in Icelandic. There are only two short long monophthong pairs, those being short i with long i and short u with long u. The other four monophthongs don't distinguish length. Most vowels also diphthongize or shift around before the sequences ng, nk, and gi. Icelandic diphthongs are ö, au, a, o, i, i, and ü. But it's the consonants where the language really stands out. The leanest stops are unvoiced like in Danish, and Icelandic has palatal stops k and k. The s sound is retracted, sounding halfway between a typical alveolar s and postalveolar sh. Icelandic lacks z and only has voiceless h. But it does have voicing distinctions between f and v, h and r, and dental fricatives th and th. Icelandic also has voiceless versions of nasals and liquids, namely hna, hl, pr, and h. The voiced versions of those sounds become devoiced before p, t, and k, with some words only being distinguished by this devoicing. Icelandic also has preaspiration, where h is inserted before various consonant clusters. There's also t insertion, where other consonants, both in clusters or alone, have a t sound added before them. Plosives sometimes become fricatives in consonant clusters, and sometimes fricatives become plosives. Initial h is usually dropped when not starting a sentence, and while Icelandic lacks vowel reduction, word final unstressed vowels are often dropped when the next word begins with a vowel. Icelandic occasionally has pulmonic ingressive pronunciation, where words in large parts of sentences are articulated while inhaling. This especially happens when pronouncing yao, the word for yes. Icelandic orthography uses acute accents to mark short and long pairs of vowels, although both i and y are used for i, and their acute forms are both used for i. For the other vowels, though, acute a represents the diphthong au, acute o represents o, and acute e is used for the sequence ye. A u strangely is used for a, and the ligature a e represents i. Icelandic also retains the letters thorn and eth for th and th respectively. The digraph hv is pronounced k, and with prefixing and suffixing, there are cases in which the same consonant can be written three times in a row. Now we can talk about the nightmare that is Icelandic grammar. One simple thing is that Icelandic has no indefinite articles. It does have definite suffixing still, inflected for case, gender, and number. Icelandic has the same four cases and three genders as German, and there are only three true possessive pronouns, once again inflecting for case, gender, and number. Nouns have different declensions depending on the gender and the consonants and or vowels at the end of the base form. Adjectives have differing strong and weak declensions, and some adjectives don't decline at all. Prepositions can change meaning based on the case of the noun, with the accusative case implying movement with direction, and dative having the meaning of an unchanging condition or a lack of movement. Verbs have the indicative, imperative, and subjunctive moods, and while infinitives usually end with a, there are different conjugation groups depending on the vowel or lack thereof. There's personal conjugation for the three persons in two numbers, and the past tense of weak verbs is formed with the, t, or d, depending on the stem. Icelandic also has the middle voice, in which the subject is both performing the action and is affected by it, a sort of combination of the active and passive voices. With vocabulary, there's a very heavy tendency to coin new words with combinations of native Icelandic root words instead of adopting loan words, and sometimes already existing roots are given new modern meanings. Next up is Faroese, spoken in the Faroe Islands, an autonomous territory of Denmark. Faroese is another insular North Germanic language and is fairly similar to Icelandic, especially grammatically. Faroese has short long pairs for all of its vowels, but some long versions of vowels are actually diphthongs, like short a corresponding to long ea, short o corresponding to long o, and e becoming long au. There are also plenty of diphthongs that have short and long pairs, differing only in length. Faroese has voiceless versions of nasals and l, usually when they devoice before the fortis stops. Like Icelandic, lenis stops are unvoiced, there's t insertion before certain consonants, and preaspiration in other contexts. Faroese has retroflex allophones of consonants that come after r, notably sh, and the postalveolar consonants ch, j, and sh, formed from various palatalized versions of other sounds. Faroese orthography has a lot of acute accents on vowels, 
some representing monophthongs, and others representing diphthongs. As mentioned earlier, many orthographic vowels represent monophthongs when short, and distinct diphthongs when long. While there are no dental fricatives in Faroese, ev is still kept, though it and d are usually unpronounced at the ends of words, and intervocalically are pronounced with an inserted ya or v. The masculine, feminine, and neuter genders are present in Faroese. The genitive case is now limited, and adjectives generally inflect similar to in Icelandic, minus inflections for the genitive. Definiteness is also suffixed. While verbs have separate conjugations for the first, second, and third person singular, there's only one conjugation for all plural subjects. Faroese also has the middle voice, and compound verbs which can be separated into their different parts. Since the Faroe Islands have been under the rule of Denmark, there's been influence from Danish on the vocabulary, though the newer loans prompted a counter-movement, which sought to keep Faroese more pure, by coining new concepts out of existing roots, giving existing roots new meanings, and bringing back older words from Old Faroese and even Old Norse. This has resulted in the amount of foreign influence being more of a middle ground, split between Danish loans and native neologisms. Danish loans tend to be used more in the spoken language, while native Faroese terms are used more often in writing, where writers make a conscious effort to use more words of native origin. Now for a language you might not have expected, Elfdalian. No, it's not the language of elves, it's spoken in the Elfdalen municipality of Dalarna County in Sweden. Unfortunately, Elfdalian is highly endangered with only a few thousand speakers left, and has no minority status since it's still officially considered a dialect of Swedish by the government. Linguistic consensus is that Elfdalian is its own language, and that becomes more apparent when you see it's the most conservative of the continental Germanic languages. It is the only modern Germanic language besides English to retain phonemic wa, it has voice fricatives v, the, and r, not found in other North Germanic languages. Sj is pronounced sia and not sia, but the Swedish sh sound is present. Elfdalian doesn't assimilate rhotic clusters to retroflex consonants, still pronounced art, ard, ars, al, and arn respectively. It has short and long diphthongs i, au, oi, and u, but it also sticks out with short and long ye and wo. There's even a triphthong in Elfdalian, eo. And on top of its already very large vowel inventory, it has nasal vowels, which were found in Proto-Germanic. Elfdalian goes all out with the nasal vowels, having nasal equivalents of pretty much every vowel and diphthong. It even writes these with Okanex, being applied to A, E, U, and even to Y and the A with an overring, with these two letters being unique to the Elfdalian alphabet. Speaking of which, Elfdalian was also continuously written in a modified runic alphabet, the Dalakarlian runes, up until the 20th century. It has the same four cases and three genders we've grown to know and love in this video, plural formation between the cases, and Elfdalian also has subject dropping. Fun! Next up is Gutnish, spoken around the island of Gotland in Sweden. While all the other descendants of Old Norse fall into either East North Germanic or West North Germanic, Gutnish doesn't fit with either, and could be classified under its own branch of North Germanic. The language isn't to be confused with Gotlandic the dialect of Swedish which is spoken on the island, although even Gutnish has become more and more influenced by Swedish, and historically there was some Danish influence from when the Danes had control of Gotland. Unfortunately, Swedish has been displacing the language on the island, and Gutnish is now endangered. Its consonant inventory is fairly typical for a North Germanic language. It has the consonants sh and ch, unlike some others, the rhotic sound has high variation, and in the Fora dialect of Gutnish, spoken on a small island of the same name right by Gotland, the rhotic can become voiceless in some cases. It has plenty of preserved diphthongs, those being i, au, a, l, a, u, o, i, o, and even a triphthong, iau. To wrap up all the North Germanic languages, let's talk about their common ancestor, Old Norse. It was the language of the Vikings, spoken from about 600 to 1400 AD, before diverging into the Scandinavian languages, and of course retained plenty of features from Proto-Germanic. Among them are keeping nasal vowels, the dental fricatives, dual number pronouns, and the traditional three genders and four cases. While Old Norse was written in the Latin alphabet during its later years, before then it was written with the traditional runic alphabet, with a few letters even making it over to the Latin version. There was also Norn, a daughter language of Old Norse that was spoken in the Shetland Islands, and learning about it brought me immeasurable joy, so I was heartbroken to learn it went extinct in the 1800s. 
but I shall turn my tears into tears of joy, since those are all the North and Western Germanic languages out of the way. To wrap things up, let's talk about the Eastern Germanic languages. They're all dead. We know the branch included the Vandalic language and probably the Burgundian language, spoken by the Vandals and Burgundians respectively, but the most attested out of them would be Gothic, which was attested from around the 3rd to 10th centuries AD, and spoken by the Goths. While Vandalic and Burgundian are limited to a few attested names and phrases, we do know quite a bit about Gothic, and it even survived as Crimean Gothic until the 1700s. Notable among its features was the lack of umlauts, labiovelar consonants qua, gua, wa, and hua, dual persons that were conjugated onto verbs, reduplication in some words, and traces of evocative case. Gothic was also written with its own alphabet. It bears a semblance to the Greek alphabet, and overall, there are a sizable amount of Greek loanwords in the language. And those were all the Germanic languages. This video was a massive undertaking, and I couldn't have done it all on my own. I'd like to give special thanks to Vilnark, the Redstoner, and Cinnamon for help with research and providing examples, Poply the Plushmaker for helping with audio editing, all the speakers of these languages who fact-checked everything, with special facts to Ku, who helped me immensely with the Yiddish section, and has a channel with some videos in Yiddish. And lastly, massive thanks goes to my patron supporters Sunder and Prague. If you'd like to support the channel, then please consider becoming a patron. And now, I'm going to say goodbye in some of these languages. Goodbye, tot ziens, auf Wiedersehen, adzi, sei gesund, hey do, farewell, haltet bra, plus, farewell.